It's wonderful to be back together with you again today and to be able to look into the Word of God with you. Before we do, let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today that your Word is alive and active, that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, that it divides between joints and marrow, soul and the spirit, that it judges the very thoughts and intents of our hearts. Lord, we thank you that your word is life and that your word is spirit. And so as we come to it today, we ask that you would take your word, that you would minister it to our hearts, to our minds, that you would strengthen us in our faith, that you would challenge us, and that, Lord, you would mold us into that which you have called us to be. And so we thank you, Father, for this in advance. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I want to look into one of the most powerful passages of Scripture in the New Testament. And uh, it's a passage of Scripture that was written to believers. It was written to people specifically who have faith. And it was written by the Apostle Peter, one of the pillars of the church, uh, the lead apostle, one could say, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in it, we, there are many vital truths that are revealed to us. Truths that will help us to understand the gospel better and that will also equip us to share that gospel with other people and to live the kind of life in the light of the gospel that God has called us to live. And so I want to have a look at this passage. I want to read it with you today. It's in 2 Peter. And we're going to read chapter 3, the whole chapter from verse 1 to verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1 to 18. I'm going to be reading from the NIV translation. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. That's referring to the Old Testament prophets. And the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, that's the times in which we live today, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. 
His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I want to bring to your attention today as we look into this passage of Scripture, four fundamentally important truths which are discussed in this passage and revealed in this passage. And then after I've listed them, we're going to have a a little more in-depth look at them. The first truth that we see revealed in this passage of Scripture is the truth that God's wrath or the outpouring of His wrath is inevitable. It's going to take place. The second one that we see here in this passage is that right now in this present time, we are living in a period of grace. We are living in a period where God is restraining His wrath in order to give people an opportunity to repent and therefore be saved. The reason for this period, this period of grace, is God's unwillingness that any should perish. And Peter brings this out in this passage. As God said through the prophet Ezekiel, He takes no pleasure in the death of a wicked man, but rather that he should repent and live. It's when people repent that God finds pleasure. The third truth that we see in this passage, which I want to just bring to your attention, is that Peter says that there will be a time when men will scoff at the Word of God and that they will ridicule the warnings that the Word of God gives us, which speak towards the coming of God's wrath upon the ungodly. And instead of heeding its counsel, men would follow their evil desires. In other words, people would disregard the warnings of Scripture and just follow recklessly in their their evil desires and their evil ways. And I believe today that we are living in this time. Peter said that this would happen in the last days. And we are living in that time where men are scoffing at the Word of God paying no attention to it, totally and completely disregarding it, ridiculing it, even though everything that is written in it is surely going to come to pass. The fourth truth that we see in this passage is that Peter said that there would be false teachers who would arise and twist the Scriptures, and in particular he mentions the teachings of the Apostle Paul, and that's very significant. They would do this in an attempt to subvert the very truths that Peter is sharing with us in this passage. And once again, as we look around today, we can see that this is happening. What Peter foresaw and what he foretold is coming to pass in our generation. What we need to realize, brothers and sisters, is we need to realize that God's wrath is coming. There is nothing that is going to stop God's word from being fulfilled. We remember the Lord Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's word is forever settled in heaven. And what we read here about the coming of God's wrath upon this earth and upon the ungodly in the earth is most certainly going to take place. It's going to happen. God has already appointed He's already scheduled this day. It's already been set in His calendar. We do not know when that day will be. As Peter said here in this passage, it will come like a thief in the night. But it will come. And we're moving ever closer to that day with every passing moment of time. We are warned about this day throughout Scripture. This is one of the great themes of Scripture is that There will be a day of wrath. There will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day where God will judge sin and sinful men. 
Let's just look at some scriptures starting in the Old Testament, just a few of the many, and uh, let's just see what scripture has to say about this. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah says this, See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for the master as for his servant, for the mistress as for her servant, for the seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. In other words, God's not going to make any distinction between what social status people have or how rich or poor they are. Isaiah says the earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. And then he says the Lord has spoken this word. This is not the words of man, but the word of God. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 to 12, we read this. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make people scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. In Nahum, Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we read this. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on His foes and vents His wrath against His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. In Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, we read this. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. In verse 18 of the same chapter, we read, Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of His jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for He will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, it says, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Even the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle of Grace, wrote this in Romans chapter 2 verses 4 to 11. Are you showing contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubborn and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourselves for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. In Paul's letters to both the Ephesians and the Colossians, he warned them that the wrath of God is going to come upon the sons of disobedience. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10, Paul wrote this. He said, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with His powerful angels, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might on the day He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. All of these passages that we've read say the same thing that we see Peter saying here in 2 Peter chapter 3. And even in this chapter, we see Peter referring us back to the writings of the holy prophets. Many people today, when we read the writings of the prophets of the Old Testament, say, but that's just the Old Testament. It's not relevant to us today. We're in a new dispensation. But we see Peter referring people who had faith in Jesus Christ, who were a part of the new covenant, back to the writings of the prophets. And it was from the writings of the prophets that Peter drew much of what he was writing and sharing with us here in this passage in 2 Peter chapter 3. You see, God has made it very clear that His wrath is coming. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Why is His wrath coming? His wrath is coming because God is a just and righteous God. We must never forget that. And for Him to be just, He has to mete out eternal punishment on every stubborn and unrepentant sinner. Everyone who spurns His grace, despises His kindness, and refuses to repent. It's, it has to happen for everyone who rejects His grace. There can never be salvation for those who do so. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ and the resultant grace of God does not mean that there will not be any more wrath. And I want to stress that to you today. It doesn't mean that no one is going to perish. It doesn't mean that sin no longer matters to God and that we can live however we please and still be saved. What does the cross of Jesus Christ mean? What does the grace of God mean? It means that there is a way to escape God's wrath. It means that we can be saved from it no matter what we have done. It means that we can inherit eternal life instead of perishing in the wrath of God. What is this way of escape that the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace of God has opened up for us? As Peter said in this passage, it is the way of repentance. It is forsaking our wicked ways and becoming followers of Jesus Christ and followers of His ways, the ways that He brought to us and shared with us while He was here on the earth. That is the way that we pass from death to life. As somebody does that, as somebody forsakes their way of life and embraces Jesus Christ's way of life, they move out of the realm of God's wrath into the realm of God's blessing and favor. As we would say, they are saved. You see, although God is a just God who must and who will punish sin and destroy sinners, He is also a loving God who does not take any pleasure in the destruction of a sinner. As it says in 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 14, God devises ways so that a banished person may not remain banished from Him. And this is exactly what God has done through Jesus Christ, through the cross of Jesus Christ, through the shedding of His blood. He has made a way for all who will believe in Christ and turn in repentance to Him to escape the punishment that their sins deserve. Through Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus our Lord has provided a just and legal way for God to forgive and justify everyone 
who believes in Him and obeys Him and saves them from the terrible wrath that is coming upon the world and instead give them eternal life. That's what the whole gospel is about. And so if we don't understand the reality of God's wrath, we can never understand the, the, the truth of the gospel and the wonder of His grace. John chapter 3 verse 16, this so much quoted and well-known verse says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him might not perish, that's referring to God's wrath, but have eternal life. Not only has God's love and His grace provided a way of escape, but in His grace He is giving the people of this world an opportunity at this present time to hear this truth, to hear this gospel and repent and so be saved. It's God's grace that has provided this way of escape and it's God's grace that is giving us time to accept that way and walk that way. Instead of just destroying us, which God had every right to do, He has chosen to be very patient and long-suffering with us, and He's chosen to show us His kindness during this time of grace and this is why we read in the Scripture that God sends His rain upon both the just and the unjust. That He causes the sun to rise on both the wicked and the righteous. Why does He do this? He is desiring to lead people to repentance so that He might not destroy them. We've got to understand God's heart in this. God's desire is not for the destruction even of the most wicked person, but for their salvation. He desires all of us to have eternal life. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, the goodness and kindness of God is intended to lead us to repentance. That's God's purpose in this time. God is reaching out to us. God is giving us a testimony of what He is like so that we might turn to Him in repentance. He's giving us time and He's hoping that we will accept His offer, the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. The chapter of uh, Luke chapter 15, where we read three parables. And one of the parables is the parable of the prodigal son. And I think we're all familiar with that parable. There's also the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep. And what we see in all three of those parables in Luke chapter 15 is that the Lord is showing us the heart of God. The heart of God, the desire of God, is that every sinner would come to this place of repentance. That they would forsake their wicked ways. That they would embrace the way of Christ. That they would follow Him and obey Him and serve God faithfully so that they might not have to be destroyed, but inherit eternal life. That's God's heart. And that's why the Lord Jesus said that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who don't, do not need to repent. That's why He told that parable of the prodigal son, where when the prodigal son came to his senses and turned back to his father, the father ran out to meet him, and threw his arms around him and kissed him and, and sacrificed, slaughtered that fatted calf, threw a great party and put his best robes upon him. You see, that is God's desire. That father represents God's heart. God's desire for every single human being is that we would turn to him in repentance and escape the wrath that he has to bring upon this world and upon the unrepentant sinner. But you know what's happened? Instead of us interpreting the time in which we live, where we are experiencing God's kindness and His goodness, this time of grace, this time where He's giving us opportunity to repent, instead of interpreting His long-suffering and His goodness and kindness in the, in the light that we've been talking about, 
with the understanding that it is designed and it is given to bring us to repentance so we might be saved. Do you know what men have done? We have erroneously taken it to be a sign that God is no longer grieved by sin, that He no longer cares about the way that we conduct ourselves in life. And you know that even in the church today, this is what many people, many teachers are teaching and preaching. And many people in the church are believing the lies of these preachers and teachers. As I uh, interact with people uh, in many different uh, sectors of society, I'm coming across more and more people that believe this lie. People that will tell me that it no longer matters how we live. That sin is irrelevant to God now. That sin is no longer an issue to God now. That we can live whatever way we want and we will still be saved. Do you know that nothing could be further from the truth? God is grieved by all that is going on in the world today. And just because He's restraining and holding back His wrath does not mean that He does not have wrath towards what is taking place in the world today. God is grieved by all the sexual immorality, all the violence, the bloodshed, and all the wickedness of men. He's just as grieved today as He was in the days of Noah and as He was in the days of Lot. His forbearance and His tolerance of our sin and His kindness towards us, even while we are practicing sin, is not a sign of His indifference towards sin or of His acceptance of it. Do you know what it is? It is a sign of His incredible love towards us in that He would do this graciously, that He would go to such lengths graciously to try and save us. We mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that God's wrath will not eventually come upon all the unrepentant. This period of grace, and Peter makes this so clear, is not infinite. It will ultimately come to an end. It will either come to an end when Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven in blazing fire, or it will come to an end when we die, whichever comes first. And if people do not take advantage of it, if we do not take advantage of it, if we do not receive God's grace for the purpose for which it has been given, which is our salvation from sin, then there is no hope for us. Only the certain expectation of the judgment of God. Yes, God's patience is great. Yes, He is slow to anger and He is rich in love. Yes, He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Nevertheless, the time will come when those who have hardened their hearts and refused to repent, just like Pharaoh did, will be destroyed, and that without remedy. Eventually, in His righteousness, God will have to say, enough is enough. And all the scoffers, all the unrepentant, all the stubborn, those who have paid no attention to His warnings, those who do not appreciate the reason for His grace, but have continued to follow in their evil desires, will ultimately perish, just as Noah's wicked generation did, and just as Sodom and Gomorrah did. At that time, the only ones that are going to be left will be the righteous, those who have believed the Word of God and have trembled and repented when they heard it, those who, like Noah, have obeyed it in holy fear, and like Lot, were grieved in their righteous souls when they saw all that the ungodly were doing and heard all that they were saying around them. The only ones who will remain are those who live holy and godly lives in the light of the certainty of the coming of the day of God. Those who make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him on that day. They alone will inherit the new creation of God, where there'll be no pain, no sorrow, no death, no more curses, no more evil, where there will just be blessing 
and light and life forever. Church, in the light of all these words, let's take heed to what, what, we've, what we've read. Let's take heed to the instructions that Peter gives. Let's do what he says. Let's make sure we do not believe or follow any so-called teacher of God's word, preacher of God's word, who would have us to believe anything different to what we've been reading in this passage today. Let's not pay attention to anyone who is twisting Paul's teaching on grace and attempting to turn it into a license for sin instead of a power to set us free from sin. Anyone who says to you that sin is no longer an issue to God is lying. Anyone who says to you that the way we live is irrelevant, it doesn't matter to God anymore because of the cross, because of Jesus' death, because of God's grace, is lying to you. Anyone who says that the way we conduct ourselves in lives as believers has no bearing on salvation is lying to you. No matter how convincing their argument sounds or how likable they may be or how successful they may appear, we must not listen to that kind of teaching because it will destroy us. We can see what Peter wrote and we need to conduct ourselves in the way he told us to. Why? Because God's wrath is coming. Listen to what he said. Let me just read verse 11 and verse 14 to you again. He said, since all these things are to melt away in this manner, in other words, he's talking about the wrath of God, what sort of people must we be? Remember, he's talking to believers here. We must conduct our lives in holiness and godliness. Verse 14, he said, therefore, dear friends, since we are waiting for these things, he's referring to that which is coming. The new heaven and the new earth which God has prepared for those who do repent. He says, strive to be found. Notice that word, strive to be found at peace, without spot or blemish when you come into His presence. In verse 17 and 18, Peter said this, and I want to leave you with these words today. He said, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. It's possible. It can happen to us. We can be carried away by the error of the lawless. We can fall from our secure position. Peter says this is what we must do. We must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love for us, your great love for humanity, your great love for the ungodly, for sinners, that you would send your only begotten Son to die for us, to make a way for us to be saved, to make a way for us to be forgiven, to be justified, to make a way for us to escape your wrath, which we so deserve. Thank you, Father, that you, out of the goodness of your own heart, in your great love, in your richness of mercy, have done this for us. Thank you, Father, that you have given us time and that you are giving us time, that you're giving the people of this world time to hear this truth and repent, to turn back to you, to forsake the wicked ways which will bring your wrath. Father, thank you that you will forgive us when we do so. You will wipe away our guilt. You will take away our sin and you will declare us righteous. Thank you, Father, for the hope that the cross of Jesus has brought to us, that the shedding of his blood has, has, has given to us the hope of eternal life, the hope of inheriting the new heaven, the new earth, the kingdom of God, the hope of this life, this abundant life which He came to bring. Father, thank You that You did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So I pray today that these words, Lord, would minister to us, not just now, but Father, every day, that they would speak to us, that they would keep us, that they would deliver us from every temptation, that they would strengthen us in our resolve to walk in holiness and righteousness and in godliness. Father, we want to take these words as you intended us to take them. We want to take them seriously. And so we ask you to help us, to help us to do this very thing and to live in the light of these words. We ask you to help us, Lord, to warn others, to make sure that people around us know this truth. I ask that you would give us boldness and courage that we would not be silent, that we would not fear the rejection of people because of this truth. But Father, that just as you have loved us, so we would love other people. Just as you have told us the truth, so in love we would tell other people the truth. Father, I pray for every single person that hears this message. Lord, that you would deliver them from the heresy that is being so propagated in the church today. The heresy, Lord, that says the way we live does not matter. I pray, Father, today that you would give us as your people a true and proper understanding of your grace and its purpose and of what is ahead, what is in store, both for us as believers, those of us who have turned to you and those who haven't. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you've never turned to Jesus Christ, if you've never forsaken your sin, if you're living a life today that is not in accordance with the way God wants you to live, if you're involved in sexual immorality, you're involved in things that you know are not right, and you want to make your life right with God, you want to make an, uh, use of this opportunity that God is giving you, you don't want to be amongst the scoffers. You don't want to be amongst those who make light of the Word of God. If that's you today, we would love it if you would contact us so that we could help you in the act of repentance, of turning to Christ. We could share more about the Word of God with you. And so I ask you to contact us. And coming up on the screen right now will be the contact details of us, our church office. And uh, if you would do that, we would be very uh, ready and very willing, very pleased to be able to help you and, and give you some of the counsel of God's Word and just help you to, to make this decision and to take this journey out from under the wrath of God into the blessing and favor of God, which can be yours for all eternity. So please don't hesitate to contact us if that's you today. May God bless you all. May He give you peace. May He make His face to shine upon you. And may He lead you in the way of everlasting life. God bless.